Welcome to Material Properties and Forces. This one is kind of a doozy. I'd like you to make sure you're taking notes in your no engineering notebook. This one will make sense a little bit later. You probably don't need to note this one down yet. Object's center of gravity or center of mass is usually graphically labeled as kind of this symbol. Um, you can determine the center location by utilizing a cross-sectional view. So this I shape is a cross-section of this I beam. So here is a triangular shape. So you could imagine if this were a triangular beam kind of coming out, that's the cross section of it. Symmetrical objects um, have a centroid location that is determined by the object's line of symmetry. So this is a symmetric object, so the centroid is located on that line. We don't necessarily know where yet just by looking at it, but it's located on that line of symmetry. Um, if you have multiple lines of symmetry, it's located at the intersection. So for a square, it's um, quite a bit easier. And then a circle um, has infinite lines of symmetry on this. So that's going to be located directly in the middle. So that's a centroid location. So you probably want to note that down. The second moment of inertia principles. So this is where we get a little bit uh, um, deeper into this. Second moment of inertia. I is a mathematical property of a cross section. It is measured in inches to the fourth, which I'll explain in just a second. And that gives important information about how that cross sectional area is distributed about a centroidal axis. So it helps to measure the stiffness of an object related to its shape. That's the big idea for second moment of inertia. It helps um, measure the stiffness of an object related to its shape. And in general, a higher second moment of inertia produces a greater resistance to deformation. So if you have a pencil like this, its second moment of inertia is probably going to be bigger in this dimension um, along this edge here than it is in this dimension. I can probably bend it a little bit easier here. So even the orientation well, you have to calculate the second moment of inertia for different orientations. And I'm going to show you this exact example. So in example A here, we have a board or this pencil on edge, and B, it's flat. So your second moment of inertia principles are different for each one. The beam properties are down here below, so just kind of um, watch along for this for a second here. There's not really much to write down yet. If same material, same length, same width and height, but you can notice that they're um, they're opposite because we changed the orientation of this. And again, the total same area. So what distinguishes beam A from beam B? Well, um, the question here that we're we're trying to ask ultimately is: Will beam A or B have a greater resistance to bending, resulting in the least amount of deformation? if an identical load is applied to both beams at the same location. And we need to know this because if you're designing um, an aircraft or something, knowing second moment of inertia principles is really important knowing how strong something is going to be um, because it needs to be able to withstand forces. If you think about how wings are attached to the fuselage, um, those wings have to be able to support their entire weight along with the inertia of it slamming into the ground and bouncing without breaking along here. So making sure that it's strong enough to support that and also knowing that orientation of that material can affect it is critical. So take a look at um, this under inventor. You can see that the deformation with the same load is almost nothing when it's vertical. It's a lot when it's horizontal. So let's calculate that. Why is that? The difference in second moment of inertia due to the orientation of the beam. Well, if we calculate that, Pause this video too, but write down this equation. Second moment of inertia equals B, which is the width or the base you can think of, times the height cubed divided by 12. So this is where I is um, in units to the fourth power because these units are the same. Your width and your height are the same units. So this to the first times this to the third gives you units to the fourth power. So let's take a look now. That's why we have inches to the fourth. If you have an inch and a half wide by five and a half inches tall, B times H cubed divided by 12, you get a total of 21 inches to the fourth. That is your second moment of inertia for beam A in that orientation, 21. If we take a look at it in the other dimension, five and a half times 1.5 cubed gives you 1.5 inches to the fourth. So that is a huge difference, 21 inches to the fourth versus 1.5 inches to the fourth. So if you've taken civil engineering here, um, you'll remember back to when you built headers, things that go over doors and windows. We put our headers, those boards go vertically for this exact reason, which is what we discussed in civil class as well, versus going horizontal because you have a lot more deflection and that would crack your window or crack your door frame if you had boards going horizontal above the door window. 
Same thing could happen for an aircraft in an aircraft design. So it is 13 and a half times stiffer. That's a lot, which is great if that's what your goal is. So we can look at a simple shape versus flange beams. We have the um, second moment of inertia here is 10.67 inches to the fourth. Total area is eight inches squared. But now let's take a look at what happens if we remove a lot of this material. Total area, or the moment, second moment of inertia is six. Total area is significantly less. Um, so you're doing a lot more with less. You have a very close to the same second moment of inertia, but your area is almost four times as less, or as small. Second moment of inertia is not even twice as small. So that's why I-beams are really useful. Um, you can do more with less. Now obviously this has a greater second moment of inertia, it's thicker, so that might be preferred, but it's gonna be significantly heavier if this is a beam going straight out. So you can, again, do more with less by making it as an I-beam shape. So these other shapes can use that principle. This is a solid one. Here's an L beam or an L channel. It's a C channel. This is a hollow core type piece and then an I beam. So they all use that same principle of doing more with less. None will be as strong as a solid beam, but the um, reduced weight makes it uh, really favorable. So let's take a look at second moment of inertia for composites. Why are composite materials used? Well, if you have just styrofoam by itself, it's going to be pretty weak. How weak, you ask? Well, we're going to test it out in the stress tester. So we're going to take a piece of styrofoam, throw it in our stress tester, and see how strong it is by itself. We're also going to take a fiberglass sandwich. Yum, yum, yum. And that's actually quite weak by itself, too. But when you put them together, styrofoam and fiberglass, with a resin, which is a hardener on this, and on this, it makes it strong. How strong do you ask? Well, you're gonna buy, you're gonna find that out when we actually build these things and test them out. So now let's look at modulus of elasticity. Another thing to add to your notes is noted by the capital E. This is a really important principle in engineering. So in in really in all types of engineering, um, bio, aerospace, civil, whatever you might do, you're gonna probably be looking at materials properties. And so this is the ratio of um, increment of some specified stress to the strain. It's also known as Young's modulus. So note that Young's modulus and it's stress to strain. So in general, a higher modulus of elasticity produces a greater resistance to deformation. Tension stress. This is what tension is. It's a body being stretched. So note that. The tension is an applied load divided by the cross sectional area. So this stress right here this is the symbol for stress this little uh, donut thing with this line coming out and so you might actually want to screenshot this hit print screen with this video full screen and then control V to paste that into your notes um, and if you're taking notes with pencil and paper then all you need to do is just note that down you can just draw that out but it's force divided by area so that's how you denote stress the shape of the cross section is not important um, appropriate cross section is the smallest area in the loaded part. So you take that smallest area and that's what you're going to use for um, testing out tension stress. Compression is squeezing it together and it, compression is also a stress. So same equation here, it's force divided by area, you're just pressing in. Tensile test is a stress strain curve. So stress, that equation that we just looked at before, or this one right here, divided by strain, which we'll take a look at in just a second, um, gives you modulus of elasticity, that E. So it is a proportional constant. It's a ratio of stress to strain. So again, stress is load or force divided by area. So again, we have that here. Strain is the amount of stretch divided by the original length. So if I take an object like this super fantastic um, lanyard right here and I were to take this and I were to apply a stress to this a tension stress and pull it apart if I take the original length that goes in the denominator down here the amount that I actually can stretch it and this is not a stretching material at all but I can stretch it a small 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 amount so that small amount that I stretch it divided by the original length that's my strain amount we take the stress divided by that strain and that gives you your modulus of elasticity. So since I cannot stretch this very much, this strain is going to be a tiny, tiny, tiny amount because that amount of stretch is small divided by a big original length. It's going to give me a tiny strain. 
if, strain. If I divide a stress, because I can apply a lot of stress to this by a tiny number, I'm going to end up with a big overall modulus of elasticity. So this is the measure of stiffness, the ability of a material to resist stretching. So since I have a big overall modulus, that shows that this does not want to stretch when loaded. A rubber band would have something that looks a lot different. Its line might go way out like here. Very little stress is required, so a low curve to get it to stretch. So again, your modulus is kind of way out here. Now once you get to this point here, after a certain amount of stress, no matter what material it is, it's going to um, start to really stretch and strain a lot. So you think about a piece of metal. If you're pulling on that, it's not going to stretch hardly at all amount of stretch. But after a certain amount of time, it's going to start to peel apart almost like a piece of gum. And it's going to really start to get thin. And that's when you've broken your elastic stress right here and it becomes non-elastic that's the plastic deformation so plastic deformation is when you cannot bring it back to its original shape um, once it's deformed along these lines here it's going to stay that way and, and what you see here what's kind of interesting is once i apply a certain amount of stress and it really starts stretching then all of a sudden i don't even have to apply as much stress and it stretches even more and more and more so maybe you've done that even with a piece of gum you kind of pull and then as you get to a certain point it stretches really really easy uh, because it's gotten sort of past that plastic deformation so this up here can be um, determined as the ultimate tensile strength so let's take a look at modulus of elasticity principles we have abs plastic and douglas fir all the same dimensions the same second moment of inertia but now we need to take a look at some other properties so what distinguishes A from B if they have the same moment of inertia? Which one will have a greater resistance to bending? Well, you can see that in this case, the ABS with the same force has more bending than the Douglas fir. So why? Well, it's because of the modulus of elasticity, the ability of material to deform and return to its original shape. You can bend a board and have it still return to its original shape. That means it's still within its elastic um, principles there. It's not gone into plastic deformation. It's just elastic deformation. So characteristics of objects that impact deflection. Applied force or load would impact deflection. The length of the span between supports. If I span from end to end, it's going to deflect a lot more than if I span from just right here to right here on that wooden beam. So that also um, affects the deflection. The modulus of elasticity affects it and so does the second moment of inertia. And those are the two that we're taking a look at here. So your delta max, your beam deflection, um, can also be uh, found using this. So where F is the force applied, L is the length, E is the modulus of elasticity, and I is the second moment of inertia. So after we calculate the second moment of inertia, same for both of these, same shape, same length, same force applied, but now we have a different modulus. And so you would find that in an engineering chart book of something that's already given for ABS and already given for Douglas fir. Well, notice it's way higher for Douglas fir. So it does not want to deflect or bend at all. But after a certain point, it will snap, whereas this might actually bend back, might actually return back to its shape. So let's calculate this beam deflection for A we get a beam deflection of 0.123 inches if we plug all those numbers in. For ABS, the beam deflection is 0.53 inches. So again, deflection is significantly more for this. So if we deflect beyond this amount, then that means it's going to go under plastic deformation, where for wood, that's just it breaking. It's where it can't go back to its original shape. For ABS, it might mean where it bends past where if you let it go, it's not going to snap back. It's going to stay bent to some extent. But it may stay bent and not snap. It might not shatter because it's not as brittle. So that's another term that we're using here. A, wood is more brittle, but it's also stiffer. So really, a lot goes into determining the materials you want to use. Glass is not going to deform hardly at all, um, probably way less than even wood. But when it does, it's going to just shatter. So it's a lot more brittle yet than even wood is. So again, this has 4.24 times less deflection. Try to